Hello, my name is Elliot Gu. I'm editor of Personal Finance and the Energy Strategist. Today I want to talk about a, a pretty unique little sector of the market, uh, rare earth metals. Um, a lot of people have never heard of rare earth metals. Uh, there are actually 17 of them. Um, and they're, they're, they're a variety of, uh, of different minerals. The reason that they're sort of grouped together is that they tend to be found together in nature. Um, some of them are a little bit more uh, common than others. Uh, but the real reason that they're called rare earths isn't that they're uncommon in nature. In fact, um, most of them are far more common than gold or silver. Uh, most of them are actually roughly as common as, say, copper uh, or some of the other industrial metals. But the reason that they're called rare is that they are rarely found uh, in a, a, a mineable form. In other words, an ore which is rich enough in rare earth elements to actually be economically producible. Uh, so there are very few areas of the world where we actually see them concentrated enough to be mined uh, economically, but they're not really that rare, uh, so it's a bit of a misnomer. Now, despite the fact that, that uh, most people have never heard of these rare earth elements, the chances are that you use them in products that you use every day. Uh, one example is that rare earth elements are used to create the color red on televisions, also on monitors uh, for computers and whatnot. Color TV would not be possible without rare earth elements, uh, which are used to create the color red. And imagine having a television that couldn't produce the color red. Um, and this has been obviously in use for a long time, since the initial development of color television. Uh, but we're seeing it a lot more now, uh, because more things that we use every day have color displays. You know, your cell phones, uh, you have your uh, uh, PC monitors. Uh, you have displays which are in color on all sorts of, uh, of items, high-tech items that you use every day. Um, another example, those little speakers on your iPod, those little speakers on your cell phone, they also use rare earth elements. It wouldn't be possible to miniaturize those speakers so you can stick it in your ear like an earbud uh, or to have a tiny little t a cell phone with a rich speaker sound. wouldn't be possible without what are known as permanent magnets. Uh, now, there's no known substitute for rare earth elements that can actually produce a magnet that small and powerful, so without them, you wouldn't be able to have those little speakers. And there's all sorts of items like that. Think about hybrid cars. Not really a huge area right now in terms of numbers on the road, but obviously growing very, very quickly. Uh, a hybrid car can have as much as 30 pounds of rare earth elements in it. Um, so if you think about that, that's about twice or more what a normal car has, but absolutely necessary. A lot of that is going, most of that actually is going into the battery. Um, you would, it wouldn't be possible to have the efficient uh, batteries that we have today again, without rare earth elements. So they're used in all sorts of varieties of high-tech gear, a lot of alternative energy technologies, catalytic converters in cars, speakers, all sorts of things that you use every day have rare earth elements in them, despite the fact you've probably never heard of them. All right, now why is this a problem? Well, this is a problem because they're the only known mines that are currently operating for rare earth elements are located in China. China controls 98% of global supply of rare earth elements. Um, earlier this year, um, China has actually been having quotas for these rare earth elements, how much they actually will export uh, outside of China. Um, the government really wants to keep uh, a lot of the supply in China uh, to develop their own industry and their own manufacturing base. Obviously, other countries want to import them. Chinese has been putting a cap on how much they can export of these rare earth elements. Um, and actually, in the second half of 2010, uh, back in July, they announced a much lower cap on exports than had been expected. They've also indicated uh, that they would actually be lowering the amount of exports they allow over the next several years. Uh, so the supply is not, is not as assured as it was a few years back. Used to be China exported tons of rare earth elements, no problem with supply. Now that China is controlling those exports, other countries are sort of scrambling to come up with alternative sources of supply for these rare earth elements. We saw some of these things quadruple and even quintuple. Some of them were actually up tenfold just this year in price uh, because of those export curbs and larger than expected export curbs on rare earth elements from China. Uh, there are really two mines in the world uh, which are being, currently being developed uh, to, to mine rare earth elements and, and serve as sort of an alternative to uh, exports from China. Uh, one of those mines is located in California. Um, this is probably, th this mine is actually, is actually scheduled to go into production in 2012. Um, and actually, it's a strategic priority for the United States. The Defense Department uh, and uh, GAO came out with a report earlier this year showing 
just how reliant the U.S. military is on rare earth elements. These are strategic metal as well. Missile guidance systems, uh, the little things that control the fins on the back of missiles, the miniaturized motors, these all contain a very large amount of rare earth elements. Without them, there's no known substitute. You know, it really wouldn't be possible uh, for the U.S. military to function long term. Um, so this has become really a strategic priority for the United States to develop this mine in California. The other area where we're seeing a lot of work, a lot of development, is the Mount Weld mine, uh, which is located in Australia. Uh, this mine is actually going to be producing next year. Um, and like the mine in California, those two mines together are going to be a pretty large percentage of global supply in a few years down the road. China is still going to control something like 70%, but these two mines together are going to be a meaningful source of rare earth elements outside of China. Uh, now, in the most recent issue of the Silk Road Investor, uh, which is a newsletter published by my colleague Giannis Mostros, uh, I actually wrote an article, a guest article, uh, which I'll be doing once a month uh, on metals-related topics. This month I wrote that guest article on rare earth elements. In there we put both stocks that are involved in these mines, uh, explain a little bit more about the industry, uh, prospects for growth, uh, what are the best stocks to buy. Uh, we have seen a little bit of a pullback in these stocks lately alongside the broader market. I think it's an excellent opportunity to buy. I encourage you to read my detailed report uh, risk-free uh, by clicking on the link at the bottom of your screen. Thank you very much.